on Sky News Business, this is Money Manager. Hi and welcome to Money Manager, the show that gives you the common sense tips you need to build and preserve your wealth. I'm Gemma Dale from NABTRADE and coming up on the program, how to maximise your tax refund. Mark Chapman from H&R Block will give us his lesser known tax tips. And claiming depreciation for your investment property, you find out how much you could potentially claim on your investments. But first, the ATO is warning that it will be cracking down on tax deductions this financial year. The tax office says it will be looking closely at work-related expenses and claims for investment properties. Clothing and laundry expenses are on the first items on the checklist, with Assistant Commissioner Kath Anderson saying that the numbers don't really add up. The ATO is focused on clothing and laundry claims, which are part of a bigger issue with work-related expenses. Now, clothing and laundry claims are on the rise, up about 20% over the last five years, and there's now about 6.3 million people collectively claiming about $1.8 billion in clothing and laundry expenses. Now, what's happening here is that almost half of all taxpayers are telling us that they have to wear a uniform that's unique and distinct to their employer, or protective clothing, or occupation-specific clothing. Now, we know that lots of people have got legitimate claims, but we don't think that half of all taxpayers would meet the rules. Look, the biggest myth is that anyone can claim $150 even though they aren't required to wear a uniform that's unique or distinct to their employer or protective or occupation specific clothing. Now last year about 1.6 million people claimed exactly $150 and for many that's a legitimate expense but we know some people are incorrectly treating it as a standard entitlement, a, a sort of safe amount that anyone can claim. So just to be clear, the $150 limit is there to make record keeping easier, but it's not an entitlement for everyone. Now some people might say $150 is not much and the ATO shouldn't worry about it. But while it's not much individually, when you multiply that by millions of taxpayers, it adds up to a lot. And besides, no matter how small, it's not okay to expect other Australians to pay for your dodgy claims. Well, keeping that in mind, 30th of June is fast approaching, which leaves little time to get your tax affairs in order. For the savvy, tax time is crunch time, a way to rebalance your finances and get some of your hard-earned dollars back in your pocket. Taxpayers are entitled to claim deductions for some work-related expenses, some. Uh, so it's time to start thinking about what you can claim to maximise your return. So what are some of the out-of-the-box ideas? For more on how you can maximise your tax return, Mark Chapman, Director of Tax Communications at h &R Block, joins me live in our studio from Melbourne. Good evening. Mark, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Yeah, well, thank you. So uh, you may have heard the package earlier with Kath yes, Anderson from the ATO me. saying that laundry expenses, they need to be legitimate. Can you talk us through it? Uh, yeah, so essentially if you're wearing uh, clothing uh, that you're required to, to, to wear for work, so something that would qualify for a deduction as a, as a uniform for instance, or an item of uh, protective or safety clothing, then you can also claim a deduction for the cost of, of laundering that garment, so whether that's uh, uh, putting it in the washing machine or, or getting it dry cleaned, uh, you can claim a deduction um, and you can potentially claim up to a dollar per load. Um, as, as Kath says, obviously the ATO are concerned that people are claiming this standard uh, dollar per load when they're not actually entitled to claim the deduction for the laundry costs in the first place. But um, uh, there are plenty of taxpayers out there who are entitled. So if you are wearing a work-related uniform or some form of protective clothing, um, then that deduction is entirely legitimate. Can you give us some examples of items of clothing that would be unique to an industry because I'm sure there are plenty of people in my industry who feel that they wear suits entirely for work purposes would never wear a suit for any other reason does that count Oh, well, I feel your pain. I mean, I often <laughs> wear a suit and I would love to be able to claim a, a tax deduction for it, but that's, that's definitely not the kind of thing that the oh. ATO has in mind. So mm -hmm. if you're working, for instance, in a, in, a, in a supermarket and you're required to wear a, a, a uniform, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's, that's going to qualify. Um, if you uh, work somewhere where you might, for instance, have to wear a, 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 a jumper or a pullover with the, the logo of the, of the business on it, again, mm -hmm. that would qualify. Mm -hmm. um, if you're wearing a, a nurse's uniform or a police officer's uniform or an army uniform, anything like that is all, is all good. 
or, or safety clothing. You know, if you're wearing overalls to protect uh, your, your, your body or your, your normal clothing underneath, again, that's all tax deductible and therefore the costs of, of getting that cleaned are also going to be tax deductible. Okay, so perhaps, perhaps not the example that I gave then. A few of your other more exciting tips for people other than laundry? Oh, look, there are lots of you know, colourful tax deductions that you can claim depending on what you actually do for a living. Um, I mean, a, a common one that a lot of people aren't aware of is that if you work outside, for instance, if you work uh, on, on road maintenance, um, you can claim things like sunscreen as a, as a tax deduction because uh, uh, you're potentially outside and they're feeling the heat of the sun during the summer and mm. therefore it's legitimate that you can claim uh, sunscreen. And that applies really to any occupation that requires you to, to, to be outside. So that's something that, that's worth, uh, worth bearing in mind. Um, if you work from home, um, you can potentially claim some deductions uh, relating to uh, the cost of running your home office. So that could include uh, a proportion of uh, your heating bills, um, mm -hmm. uh, your, your home internet bills, your home phone bill. Um, you can claim the depreciation on the, the equipment inside your home office. Uh, you've got to be careful there because, again, that's an area that the ATO are, are looking at quite closely because they think that people are claiming uh, too much of those, of those bills. So you've got to get the proportion right between your, your work and, and your business. Uh, or alternatively, if you don't want to get involved with the detailed record keeping, you can simply claim uh, a flat rate, 45 cents per hour, uh, for every hour that you work from home, for instance, uh, working overtime or at weekends. Uh, but again, that's not a standard deduction, so you've mm. got to have actually uh, spent that time working at home in order to claim it. It's an interesting one that way. You say 45 cents per hour, by the time you add that up, you need to be working from home quite a great deal to make it a meaningful deduction. Oh yeah, it's, if, you're, if, you're, if you're looking to claim working from home, it's better to actually claim the actual costs. Um, you'll, you'll generally come up with a bigger tax deduction. The mm. downside of that is that you've got to keep all of your receipts and your invoices to, to quantify what the amount of that tax deduction actually is. Um, that 45 cents per hour is really designed to simplify the system for people who haven't kept receipts and they've got to the end of the tax year and realise that they, uh, uh, they can't prove what their electricity bill was three months ago, for instance. Yeah. Um, mm. So, uh, provided you can uh, work out how much time you actually spent, if, if you claim that flat rate allowance, you're still entitled to a deduction, but it will usually be less than you could have claimed if you'd kept all the paperwork. So one last one, someone pointed out to me today, and I'd missed it, that you, you can claim a deduction now for personal contributions to super. I didn't miss that. That is a big deal. So salary sacrifice is not the only option for, for employees. But the ATO has been allocated $3 million extra in the federal budget to follow up on whether or not people got their paperwork correct with their Section 290 notices. That seems yes. extraordinary. Yeah, so what, what you've got to do, you, you can, anybody can now claim a personal uh, contribution into their, into their superannuation. They can do it through their tax return. Um, and provided you don't breach the, uh, what's, what's called the cap, which is $25,000 per year, um, you, you can do that. Um, uh, and, and actually, as we're still a, a week away from the end of the financial year, uh, you've still got time to do it this year and, and crystallise mm. the deduction. The problem is you've also got to send in a form uh, to your superannuation uh, provider. Um, you can get the form off the ATO website. Um, mm. And that is, is, is what's called a notice of intent. So the superannuation uh, provider knows that you've made the contribution. They have to acknowledge that. Um, and that's part of the legal requirement the ATO places. Uh, they're concerned that uh, a lot of people are sending in that form and therefore mm. the superannuation company is not deducting tax at their end as they should be doing. So what you now have to do when you lodge next year's tax return, there's now a new box on there and you have to actually tick um, whether you've uh, submitted that form or not. And if the answer is no, then unfortunately you can't claim the tax deduction. So that's how the ATO are tracking down people who haven't completed uh, all the paperwork. So get your contribution in between now and uh, the end of next week if you want to make the contribution this year but don't forget to send in that form. Mark thanks so much. No problem thank you. It's, um, so it's worth noting that this year 30th of June is on a Saturday so if you do want to make those last minute super contributions you might want to do it a little bit earlier in the week. Uh, it is the day that it's actually received by the fund not the day that you make the contribution that counts so maybe Monday or Tuesday for that one. Coming up after the break, deductions for your investment property. We will get you across the common missed opportunities next. You're watching Money Manager on Sky News Business.
Welcome back. Switching now to property deductions and according to BMT tax depreciation, around 80% of property investors are missing out or not maximizing their claims. I was probably one of those people. Investors are entitled to claim depreciation for the building itself and for the items within, which can effectively minimize your tax burden. Despite recent changes to depreciation legislation, BMT says there are still thousands of dollars in deductions that can be claimed by property investors. So what can you claim and how much can you save on your tax return? For his tips, I'm pleased to welcome Bradley Beer, CEO of BMT Tax to Depreciation, who joins me live in the studio. Bradley, thanks for joining us. Great to be here, thanks. So, busy time of year for you, very, very busy. Yeah, June's always pretty busy. That's when people start thinking about tax, so they start ordering the things that they they need for their tax. And I guess we've probably been pretty good at educating people that, you know, if you order it, if you're going to use it for your tax return or depreciation schedule, the bill's actually deductible. So you should order it in June, <laughs> not July. Yeah, yeah, very helpful to get in now. Okay, mm. so you've got seven days. Um, yes, but that's get... okay. You can still order them and, 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 and pay for them and you make the deduction for that this year. Yeah, nice, okay. So depreciation, talk us through the kinds of of things that are depreciable and also the changes that have been made that will affect what you can claim a depreciation for this year. Yeah, look, depreciation is a fairly simple, simple fundamental piece of the of the tax legislation that applies to, to many no, things. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> simple is probably wrong, but mm. I guess the concept when you you know, like get it simply uh, uh, is has some simplicity around it mm. in that people understand if you use, for example, a car for business, mm. you it depreciates in value because cars go down so quickly. Mm. Uh, and, and if you use it for business, you get to make some deductions for that in depreciation. Now with property, if it's used for investment, which includes, you know, for rental houses or for commercial properties or basically anything except your personal place of residence, then this concept kind of exists in a similar way where the- Sorry, for income producing purposes or anything? For, for income producing purposes. Yeah. So your principal place of residence is not an investment property, so it doesn't get depreciation, mm. but anything else pretty much, if it's used you know, for a rental or, mm. or to run a business from or run your business from, uh, then this depreciation will apply. And what it simply is, is you know, things like your carpet, the hot water service, your stove, your blinds, and for that matter, your, your bricks and mortar are mm. wearing out a bit like your car does. And the tax office lets us make a deduction for the wear and tear or decline in value of those items over time uh, and it uh, means that you get you know quite substantial deductions back at the end of the year by doing it properly and we see a lot of people not do it properly. Yeah. Okay so talk us through what's changed because there were some fairly substantial changes in last year's federal budget. They're in effect this financial year. Yeah, look, I um, in I've been BMT for 20 years, uh, and uh, and it's the biggest change. There's been a few changes over time, but it's the biggest one I've seen in that period of time. And what they've done is said that, you know, with some of those items we talked about there, the plant and equipment, mm. it's kind of said that once that becomes secondhand, as a secondhand buyer, you're no longer to get to claim a deduction against that those secondhand items. Mm. What you still do get to claim is against the structure of the building, mm -hmm. uh, the, the concrete walls, the floors and the roof, which, okay. which makes up about 85 to potentially 90% of the total claims over the life of the property. Um, so for secondhand residential, uh, people that buy secondhand residential properties, mm. this affects come into, this change has come into effect mm. for anyone that uh, purchased after the budget night last year yeah. in May. Um, new properties are not affected. Um, if you buy things and add them to your property, they're not affected. So you still get to claim for those things, but you know, in, that's a pretty good close summary to the changes I suppose that have happened. Okay. so. Have you found a lot of people come and get their depreciation schedules updated because of the changes? Is that necessary? Uh, no, it's not necessary to update them because this this applies to people who entered into a contract to buy a property. Of course, okay. um, From budget night, basically, yeah. and and look, I was at budget night and mm. and sitting there listening to the to, the, the explanation, choking mm. on my steak as they said depreciation <laughs> changes, yeah. uh, and so nobody really knew much about the change, including us that were mm. involved, uh, and. Uh, but then it went through a whole process of what, you know, going through us to go through Parliament. And it mm. took actually till November to get the legislation. But mm. whatever you were before, if you bought before, you're not affected mm. uh, pretty much. And after that, um, it's just people who bought after that time that are affected by these changes. Okay. And then when you say bought, it's the contract of sale on that date 
Budget night's always a nightmare when they try to backdate things to it, so you've got to be quite careful about the timing and new properties not affected. So plenty of people who still need to go and get their depreciation sorted for this financial year. Anything they should be looking out for? Look, it still needs to be sorted properly is the important thing. Mm. Um, I think if if I talk specifically about coming to the end of the financial year, well, firstly, as we said, that, that bill's deductible in this year, so you probably should do that then, mm. um, because if you're going to do it in July, you might as well spend the money and spend the money in June, mm. which is like lots of things, you know, if you do need to buy them. I, I, the other probably main point up to around this time of year is you're about to go and do another tax return pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Firstly, so many people don't actually take advantage of it properly. Mm. Um, we, we, we did some research that come up with those percentages based on looking at what people had claimed and seeing, look, if we did this properly uh, and you know, doing it properly means visiting the property and applying all the things to do it properly, then there's some deductions there to be claimed. And if you've owned the property for some time or for a couple of years, you can actually go back pretty easily and amend up to two years of your tax returns. Mm. So before you do another tax return, make sure you get it assessed and see if there's some deductions there because you might miss on, on, out on a year going back. And I think some of the reasons why people don't do it properly uh, come down to a lack of knowledge around some of the rules. And regardless of changes of age of property, of second hand and things like that, it's always, you know, you should ask the question and see if you can get some of these deductions. And someone like the quantity surveyor that does depreciation schedules, like us, we, we will talk to someone about their property and be able to pretty easily give an indication of what sort of deductions should be there before we actually go and do any work. So it doesn't cost anything to sort of ask some of those questions pre-30 June, yeah. yeah. Bradley, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. So since the uh, government has managed to finally secure passage of its entire income tax plan, the Prime Minister is now saying he's open to bringing forward tax cuts if the budget allows. Malcolm Turnbull is now saying he will always be on the lookout to give more tax relief in the future. We will always be on the lookout for the opportunity to give more tax relief in the future, but of course, at the same time as we bring the budget back into balance and we ensure that we guarantee essential services. So, you know, my, uh, you know, my commitment, the government's commitment, the legislation that's been passed is for this tax relief program to follow its course and be completed, the reform to be completed in 24-25. It's a tax cut on the never-never that there's two, possibly three elections before it's fully implemented. But if, if you were to bring it forward, you would negate that no, no, it's a long-term plan and we've provided a long-term plan to provide income tax relief. It's a plan that is fair, it's a plan that is fiscally uh, affordable. Uh, but of course, I mean, as a government, we always focus on uh, making sure that uh, taxes are only as high as necessary, as low as possible. From next week, tax cuts out of $530 for people on $50,000 to $80,000 a year, although they won't get a refund until their next year's tax return, and people on $200,000 a year will receive an extra $135 from 2024, but that will skyrocket to more than $7,000 because the tax brackets will change. For more on those tax cuts and what it will mean for your hip pocket, James Dagar Nixon spoke with Jeremy Thorpe, partner and chief economist at PwC. People aren't going to feel this in their hip pocket till effectively a year's time. The way the tax cut has been structured with a tax offset means that we don't get money in our pockets every week, we get a refund in a year's time. So uh, we're not going to feel this in the short term. This is not a, a boost to the economy in a practical sense here and now, mm -hmm. but I think it lays out that people can have confidence that bracket creep is going to be ameliorated over the next couple of years and that they can look forward to more money in their pocket, which will ultimately flow through to the economy. I imagine many people though would be suggesting, look, I'm currently struggling with uh, rising living costs, the, you know, the pressure that that comes to bear. How has this helped me at all? What about the argument that portions of it should be brought forward? Uh, look, people are always going to want a tax cut now. I think at least people can plan to have a tax cut. And the government's made a fair bit of uh, a claim, which has a bit of resonance, which is rather than, you know, a milkshake and a, or 10 chicken nuggets every week, mm. which is kind of what we were looking at, 
getting it in a lump sum means that people can actually do something substantial with it. There's actually more scope for people to say, I'm going to spend it on something uh, meaningful. So I think there's, there's pros and cons, obviously, of a little bit in the pocket every week versus a lump sum. One of the, the hallmarks of this package is the over the years that the flattening of, of the, the, the tax bracket system, you know, essentially removing one and, and lowering the top marginal tax rate. I mean, it, there have been criticisms, certainly by the opposition, but others that it it isn't progressive. We had the Treasurer again this morning and, and yesterday saying, no, that is not correct. It is progressive. It is still those earning the most will still pay the most amount of tax and that increases. Your thoughts on the argument as to whether or not the, the new tax system is, is progressive? I side very much with the government here. Um, even at the end of this process, the top 5% of taxpayers will pay 34% of all tax uh, from income tax. We've done modelling. And so rather than just looking at the marginal rates, which are in the tax schedule, we've done modelling where the Australian Tax Office provides us, I think it's about 2% of all taxpayers' data, de-identified, so don't worry, but randomised. <laughs> so you can actually see how will it affect real people. And what we actually see is almost no change in the effective tax rates that come out of this process. This really is about taking away bracket creep. Uh, and so that it, it, the progressivity of the system is absolutely maintained. Now the opposition says, well, the, the people on higher incomes, uh, uh, higher incomes are going to receive larger tax cuts. That's absolutely true. But that's because they pay far more. And so you're always going to get that outcome. In a progressive system, the more you tax, uh, the higher incomes are going to pay more, but equally, when we make adjustments, they're going to receive a greater benefit. It's just the nature of the progressivity, progressivity of the system. As far as income tax cuts are concerned, was there anything more or is there anything more you would have liked to have seen? I mean, is, a, uh, is, is the top rate still too high? I mean, would you like to see it come down or are there other aspects that could be introduced to, to boost a, a level of, uh, I suppose, equality, if you like, within the system? So a couple of interesting things. By flattening the rate, and we obviously haven't had corporate tax cuts yet uh, mm. in, in any significant way, but by flattening the rate, you actually reduce the incentive for people to try and structure their businesses, say, as a tradie, so that you are putting everything through a company rather and trying to avoid tax by using a company structure. So it might be an unintended consequence, but this, this change actually takes away some of that incentive for people to game the system. But clearly at the top end, uh, by reducing the rates for middle and low income earners, we actually make it even more of an incentive at the top end because we have globally high rates for uh, high income earners, particularly after the Trump tax cuts, but whether we compare ourselves to the UK or Canada or other kind of countries that we normally benchmark against. So we just need to be careful and you now the, the politics of bigger tax cuts for the high end is challenging, but we create incentives for people to actually seek to avoid it through legitimate means, mm. but through complex tax structuring. And that's probably not in the interests of the country as a whole. You mentioned you know, what is happening in, in, in other economies, tax cuts in, in the UK, uh, tax cuts over in the US and other parts of the, of the world and, and where you're seeing other, in particular, uh, corporate tax rates, particularly around the region. You know, should we be engaging in a, in, in competition, if you like, for um, for having a lower corporate tax rate. I mean, is that really going to be the the key decision for foreign capital? It's not necessarily the key decision. We know a whole range of factors affect uh, where capital flows, intellectual property rights, rule of law, um, the, the attractiveness of the market and resources and so forth. But tax is clearly one of those key factors that fit in that mix. Um, the reality is we are competing against the globe. Um, now, we don't need to be competing with the Singapore's or the islands of the world, but mm. we know that effectively we will have the second highest corporate tax rate in the OECD once France lowers as its corporate tax rate. Now, we don't need to be competing with the bottom, but we at least need to be in the middle of that pack. And so the corporate tax cut uh, is the next element of the tax reform that the government is prosecuting, and it needs to prosecute, and it needs to have passed. That's all we've got time for tonight. I'm Gemma Dale from NAB Trade. Have a lovely evening.